geometric concept for the maps in general relativity. Thank you. So in this lecture, we have to bring together the inverse mean curvature flow and the mean curvature flow. And before I come to the mass, let me first do the simpler case of cones or asymptot manifolds that are asymptotically cone-like. So let us look at the three-dimensional case now. So we have a three-manifold, Riemannian three-manifold, complete, smooth, no boundary. And uh, we assume now that the Ricci curvature uh, of this uh, metric uh, G bar is greater or equal to 0. And uh, we look again at this situation where we have some domain omega, we have some boundary of this domain omega, and we are interested in the isoparametric behavior of this thing. And we make two definitions. So define, first of all, the isoparametric cone ang angle of this three-manifold to be the infimum of uh, the uh, area to the power 3 over 2 divided by 6 square root of pi times the volume of omega. So you know that the isoparametric cone angle in this definition of R3 would be equal to 1. right? And the other definition I make is the um, functional Well, you can take any um, omega um, uh, in, in any any domain. Let's let's say of type of the ball, but it can, can it can be huge. Yeah. No, but I was wondering if small thing could give a different infimum that you need big things to have some asymptotic. Well, the, the the amazing thing will be that this condition uh, gives a theorem in the end that the behavior at infinity, that's the whole point, the behavior at infinity of this thing will completely determine it even down to the smallest region. So, so that's, that's exactly, yeah. So the quantity that is important here is uh, 1 on 4 square root pi, for 1 on 4 pi square root, yeah, like this, times the integral of the mean curvature of uh, the boundary surface. So in Euclidean space, note that in R3, uh, we have the isoparametric uh, um, uh, constant to be equal to 1. And notice that in Euclidean space, actually, the integral of the mean curvature squared over any two surface is bigger than 16 pi, meaning that this uh, uh, um, quantity here is uh, greater or equal than 1. Okay. Now, the theorem I claim is the following, that if you have a three-manifold with non-negative Ricci curvature, then you can completely characterize this isoparametric constant in terms of the infimum of Q. So the theorem says that the isoparametric constant of the three manifold uh, is the same as the infimum of all the q of the omega where omega cons sitting in n3 g bar is outward minimizing uh, the q is the square root thank you So, so the intuition is that in um, a uh, in in in, uh, in the plane, of course, all the constants are given by these numbers here, and if the Ricci curvature is greater or equal to zero, the three plane is sort of bent invert, so you can put more volume in a given area, so the um, infimum here will be much smaller. And at the same time, if sort of this three-manifold closes and ends in a cone, then 
the integral of the mean curvature squared also will be quite a bit smaller. In the extreme case, it will go down to zero when you end up in a cylinder and then the cross section is a minimal surface. So the integral of the mean curvature squared sort of measures the cone angle uh, at infinity in terms of some curvature sense and uh, the isoparametric constant measures the uh, uh, cone angle at infinity um, in terms of area and volume and the theorem is that these two notions are the same and uh, you can control one by the other and you can characterize one by the other. Now the idea here is uh, now to use a different flow to do this and um, the way we do this is um, we have to use two flows. So one flow will be the mean curvature flow that I was talking about on Wednesday so we let the we have the mean curvature flow available to us to push a given initial surface inward and sweep out sort of the interior of the domain omega. So this will be mean curvature flow. But at the same time, we have all, for all of these surfaces that move by mean curvature flow, we have the possibility of moving outward to infinity and compare uh, the surfaces to infinity with the help of inverse mean curvature flow. So the idea is to play these two flows off against each other. One of them, the inverse mean curvature flow, will allow us uh, to show that the integral of the mean curvature squared uh, takes its infimum at infinity, giving us a lower bound on integral h squared on all the outward minimizing services that might appear during this mean curvature flow here. And on the other hand, on the mean curvature flow, we will use that lower bound on integral h squared to get a control on volume and area. And I'll show you that calculation and how the two things uh, come together. So I need some white chalk here. So the key computation. Right. Uh, well, if you want to do deal with the isoparametric inequality, we can always assume um, the surface uh, that we start with is already outward uh, minimizing. Otherwise, we take its um, outward minimizing hull, and that will have um, then the same area and uh, larger volume. Yeah. So. Assume, without loss of generality, that uh, we have a surface, uh, some initial surface sitting, being the boundary of some domain, and omega is outward minimizing. Okay, and then let N2T be a solution of uh, mean curvature flow. So we have uh, ddt f equals mean curvature vector uh, with initial surface uh, um, n2 uh, 0. So this is the um, orange family. And then Let's do the smooth calculation. So again, assume everything is smooth along mean curvature flow. And then we get following calculation. We compute DDT along mean curvature uh, flow is uh, the area changes like minus mean curvature squared d mu. That's one thing we need to know. And uh, DDT of the volume of the region enclosed at time t is uh, minus the integral of the speed. So if you put these two things together, you, you get that DDT of the, um, uh, let's take the difference there of uh, boundary omega to the 3 over 2 um, 
minus um, a certain constant c0 times uh, 6 pi to the 1 half times the volume of omega t. So this is the quantity uh, you look at. And you get um, from here minus 3 over 2 area to the power 1 half times integral h squared d mu over the evolving surface. There's a t of everywhere here. Uh, from this term and from here you get plus c0 6 pi to the 1 half times the integral of the mean curvature uh, also over the boundary. And now this is just crying out for Hölder's inequality. So you estimate this from above by, and let's pull out integral of the mean curvature right away. So we get from there c0 times 6 pi to the 1 half from this term. And from here we get minus 3 over 2 times, and then I don't need the square to complete the Hölder inequality. I just need one square root, and I've left a square root of this integral left over. And now you see that if the integral um, h squared is uh, larger than this number c if this number uh, q is larger than c0, then I get the desired inequality less or equal to 0. Right? If uh, q of the omega t is larger than uh, c0 for all t along the flow. So again, it's a simple calculation. Um, so if uh, we choose our constant c0 uh, to be the uh, exactly as defined in the theorem, the infimum um, of all these q's, um, then it just works out. The thing we have to make sure is that we have a solution and that the solution is outward minimizing all the time because we have taken the infimum only over the outward minimizing surfaces. All right, so the difficulty is difficulty is uh, uh, existence of a solution. And again, this solution will usually have singularity, so you need an existence of weak solutions such that um, uh, and 2t is uh, outward minimizing. I'm, I'm just showing you sort of how to get one direction, right? That, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, you, but even why do you need it for all t? Why not just at, at t? So if you pick omega to be the one for which this infimum is attained, it's actually known to be attained exactly, not just the infimum, it's the minimum. And actually it's attained on a smooth set. Right, but okay. I still, yeah. Um, so if, if, if uh, you could, if the derivative of time zero would be negative, then you could actually obtain a contradiction. You just need the, the, this thing to hold for time t equals zero. Uh, how do you know that the, but I need to know this, but I want, I want the whole infimum of this quotient to be controlled. So I also want to, I, I want to, for any, for any domain, I want this. Uh, yeah, so you choose the worst one. But this is attained at infinity. Um, if the volume is infinity, yes. Right. Yeah, the, the, yeah, it's attained at infinity. So I have to sort of. So for the compact case, there's another one. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. But, but here the, the point is really that everything is happening at infinity. So I have to, so really all the arguments are essentially happening, of course, on a sequence of surfaces that are let tend to infinity. I just want to show you the calculation and so how, how the integral h squared comes in. Yeah. But you, the point, the whole point is that you, yet in general, you do not have a surface where any of these things is attained. In fact, you can prove that if you find a surface where this is att attained, that no, then it's not a Euclidean, it's a cone. Oh, uh, okay. All right. So, so, so from 
Yeah, let, let me just finish this argument, right? Okay. Yeah. So why is that there can be no minimal surface under real conditions? Oh, Ricci greater or equal to zero if uh, there can be no stable minimal surface. Why? So we could be sealing them, right? Um, so like S2 plus R. Yeah, right. Okay. So I have to make some assumption to rule out that, that cross product. So let's, let's yeah. I, I just, you have to obviously make some assumption that that, that uh, you're bounding a domain. If you have S2 cross R, you're not bounding a domain, right? Yeah. I, I'm looking at the at the point where you immediately have a where you have at least one surface of strictly positive mean curvature. If you don't have that, you get the splitting theorem. I mean, it's well known that you have the splitting theorem. And, um, the second variation just tells you that if you have a minimal surface, it needs to be it needs to be total geodesic. Yeah, right. But you know, I don't see no contradiction with which you go to the zero. But then the surface is not bounding a domain. It's just going. Oh, okay. Right. So so unless the splitting theorem is very strong. Unless okay. the whole thing is splitting, then you find one surface of non negative mean curvature which at in instantaneously turns into a surface of strictly positive mean curvature and then it will contract in finite time and so on. Yeah. So so the yeah, there's one. That's the theorem. Either it splits, or you have just one end. And why is that? If you have one end, you cannot have one minimal surface. I don't understand why. Um, because. One minimal surface, then that be zero. So you take. Right. Yes. But I'm looking at outward minimizing boundaries here only. So. So, so if it's outward minimizing minimal surface, then it's because the minimal surface is minimizing at all, and then it's uh, stable. If it's stable, it's solely geodesic, and so yeah. So let's. I I want to get to the general relativity part. I just want to use <laughs> this. It's so so okay. <laughs> Don't worry, I have it like in the last lecture. So the, I, I just want to point out the existence is hard. You have to prove this. There's existence of a weak solution, and it's outward minimizing, and you have to show that as uh, uh, t approaches some finite time, um, area uh, and volume tend to zero. So in the limit, you get that both, um, uh, that both these uh, uh, quantities in this difference are equal to zero. Uh, so since it was monotone at the beginning, you must have the isoparametric inequality. Inequality plus rigidity statements. So, if you, in particular, if you find one surface, um, let, let's be assume we are already in the case where, say, Ricci curvature is positive to, to, to not deal with these special cases. If you find uh, um, one surface where integral h squared. Uh, attains its minimum, then the whole exterior has to be a cone over that surface. And the other way around, if you have one surface where the isoparametric inequality is actually uh, attained with equality, then the interior of the thing has to be a cone. Yeah? Because you simply get a splitting theorem. And this work here, uh, this is due to many people. There is uh, Chen, Giga, and Goto with their weak solution of level sets. There is um, Evans and Sprague independently, but I should p in particular point out that uh, Brian White has uh, shown <coughs> that in the case of positive mean curvature, all the level sets of this weak solution are <coughs> outward minimizing, so they have exactly uh, the property that we need. And he has also shown that in the case n equals 2, they are smooth for almost all t. So he's shown this wonderful regularity result for mean curvature flow, which allows us um, actually to uh, then <coughs> use this fact on outward minimizing surfaces on each single solution of um, um, mean curvature flow, and on the on each level set of this mean curvature flow. And on the other hand, outward minimizing is uh, exactly has been the condition that allows us to use inverse mean curvature flow 
um, on each surface here and relate it to infinity um, because this monotonicity of integral h squared that I computed in the last hour um, uh, still works if the Ricci curvature is greater or equal to zero. So that, that's, that's where the Ricci greater or equal to zero condition comes in, right? That calculation that ddt of integral h squared for the weak solution of uh, inverse mean curvature flow is uh, less or equal to uh, zero in this case, this calculation is exactly the one where you use uh, Ricci greater or equal to zero. And if you use both these monotonicity formulae and stick them together, th the calculation I showed you in the last hour and the calculation here, and you do it right, then you can characterize sort of both inequalities in this theorem. You can estimate this from above by that, and you can estimate that from above by this. All right? Each direction is, one direction is mean curvature flow, the other direction is inverse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Now, uh, what I want to get at is that you can now extend this idea uh, to the case of non-negative scalar curvature. So you, this, this is sort of the case where you have non-negative Ricci curvature and then the model space you have to think of is the cone. And the thing you can characterize with these isoparametric constants either with the area and volume or with the integral of the mean curvature squared and in fact I could have taken integral of the mean curvature or integral of any other power of the mean curvature uh, between 1 and 2 in order to get a similar characterization. Um, this thing then transfers to something um, where you, uh, in manifolds of non-negative scalar curvature, which are open, you can uh, link the isoparametric behavior to the mass. Uh, except that the scaling is different. You see, the isoparametric cone angle and this number q, these are scale-free quantities, right? There, there's no scaling in these quantities. and um, uh, clear, a cone angle, it's an angle, there's no scaling. But the mass, of course, has a dimension, and there's scaling coming in. So I claim that if you, do, if you change the scaling appropriately, and you apply the same ideas to manifolds of non-negative scalar curvature, then you get a characterization of the mass in terms of the isoparametric behavior of the manifold. And uh, so let's look at a three manifold that arises in general relativity. So we have a three manifold, M3 G, G bar, which is uh, complete, which is asymptotically Euclidean. So I assume that the metric um, is uh, some little o of, uh, of 1, say, as uh, r tends to infinity. I assume that the scalar curvature of the metric is greater or equal to 0, much weaker con condition. And I assume that the boundary of M3 consists of uh, f at most finitely many two spheres. And these two spheres have zero mean curvature, the minimal spheres. And uh, these are the only minimal surfaces in uh, M3G. In other words, the, they are outward minimizing. And the picture you should have in mind is therefore this. You have uh, maybe some stars, you have a black hole, another black hole, something like this. Right? Here you have, say, positive scalar curvature, and here you have uh, sigma 1, and here you have uh, sigma 1. But uh, if you like, you can forget about uh, <coughs> the physical interpretation and just think of this Riemannian situation. This is a cross-section to an isolated gravitating system modeling some stars, black holes, binaries, galaxies, whatever you like. The scalar curvature condition comes from uh, an energy condition and um, the uh, Newtonian analog that you should think of is that you have R3 
and you have some density function, and you have La Poisson equation, and uh, you're interested in the mass. The mass is uh, the integral of the density over R3, and you can express the density back by the potential and do the divergence theorem to interpret the mass as a limit r tending to infinity of 1 on 4 pi integral of the flux integral of the potential over the sphere at infinity. And uh, it turns out that this um, formula here um, is, uh, of course, um, here it's trivial that the mass is greater or equal to zero, but in this setting it's not so clear how you define the mass. The potential here, the prime example you should have in mind is 1 minus m on r, of course, the Newton potential, and you should have in mind that the potential always uh, falls off like 1 on r squared, such that this integral has a chance to converge. And the role of the function u is now taken by the metric here, which tends to the uh, Euclidean metric near infinity. And the classical uh, example here the, that corresponds to the Newton example is the cross-section in Schwarzschild. So that's this single black hole where the three-manifold has a special metric. It's R3 outside uh, uh, the um, outside the region where r is uh, less than m over 2 and the metric gm is a conformal metric to the euclidean metric that's this picture here and then um, you have just one horizon uh, and this is the set where r equals m over 2. Right? That's the main example. And in this case, you have the scalar curvature of this uh, metric identically 0. m is the mass of the black hole. The surface is the horizon of the black hole. And you have sort of a nice rotationally symmetric uh, situation. Okay. Now, in, uh, in general, people had this uh, definition of the ADM mass of the three manifold, uh, which was a flux integral of a uh, similar kind as this Newton thing here, r tending to infinity uh, integral of certain derivatives of the metric that I'm not going to write down. So the metric takes the role of the um, Newton uh, potential and uh, issues of whether this is coordinate invariant, when does this converge, and you need reasonably strong conditions on the fall off of the metric G bar to show that this is a geometric invariant. And there's the famous positive mass theorem by Shane Yao, later other version by Witten, saying that this M is greater or equal to zero, this M ADM is greater or equal to zero with equality if and only if you have that uh, uh, you are in R3 with the standard metric. And then there is the Penrose inequality proved by myself and uh, Tom Ilmanen and in a different version by Bray saying that this mass is in fact bounded below by the uh, area of the uh, black hole in the middle. Uh, but all these theorems assumed some very strong um, assumptions on the decay of the metric near infinity. So what I would like to sh convince you of is that it is better to characterize the mass in terms of the isoparametric behavior of the three manifold. And uh, so why should isoparametric behavior come in? Excuse me, I, I don't understand the 
here, right? So you take um, so you take di gij minus dj gii times the sigma i sum over i and sum over j, and this is a um, if the decay of the metric is nice, then this gradient of g decays just like in the Newtonian case, like 1 on r squared, and you have a chance that this actually converges because these boundaries grow like r squared, and then this gives a number, and this number turns out to be a geometric invariant. That goes back to Weil and Arnovit Desa Misner. Uh, right. That's, yeah, and people have sort of, I mean, it's, it, it's not bad in the sense that um, the physicists are happy with the conditions and say so all, all our main examples are covered by the uh, conditions that are necessary to prove this theorem. But on the other hand, it is uh, certainly not, uh, not a clean uh, sort of definition here. And uh, certainly you need certain differentiability properties uh, on, on the metric. Uh, you need conditions up to the second derivatives of the metric to, uh, to prove these theorems. Um. Now, why does isoparametric property come in? First one, you see this if you just look at the scalar curvature. The scalar curvature has something to do infinitesimally with the isoparametric behavior. Because if you take any point in the three-manifold and you check what is the isoparametric behavior of a small ball around this point? So you just compute what is um, the, uh, uh, oops, here, the 6 pi 1 half. Good. Let's do it like this. The volume of Br around P minus uh, this uh, um, quantity that comes up in the, oh, it's 1 over, right? 1 over this quantity, right? So this is the thing that in Euclidean space is equal to 0 on round balls. So let's check what it does on geodesic balls in a tiny neighborhood around P and do a Taylor expansion. And what you find out is that there is some constant that just that depends on the dimension, which is 3, times the scalar curvature at that point P times r to the 5 plus um, lower order terms. In other words, higher power so far. So in other words, the scalar curvature tells you, non-negative scalar curvature tells you that infinitesimally you can put at least as much volume in a given area as in Euclidean space. So I call this sub-isoparametric. Yeah, you can infinitesimally, it's sub-isoparametric, you can put more volume like in Euclidean space. And I claim this is sort of, in some sense, similar as uh, subharmonic. The U is subharmonic. So, so I, c I claim that this condition that you have from Newtonian mechanics, that you have a non-negative density and therefore you deal with subharmonic functions, and subharmonic functions satisfy a mean value inequality. Right? This thing here says that u at any point p is less than the average of u around some ball around p. This is the mean value inequality that characterizes subharmonicity. That that condition is replaced in general relativity in this three manifold by the condition scalar curvature greater or equal to zero instead of Laplace u greater or equal to zero. And the way to properly interpret this at the C0 level, when you just talk about area and volume, the proper way to interpret it is to say that you have sub-isoparametric. You can put more volume per area than in Euclidean space. So that's the first indication that maybe the positive mass theorem has something to do with the isoparametric behavior. Now the second uh, observation you make is you check out the isoparametric profile of um, our model spaces. So check the isoparametric profile of the most important examples. 
So what's the isoparametric profile? This is a function, phi m, which starts at the area of the uh, boundary of uh, the manifold. So that's 16 pi m squared. This is the area of the boundary and gives us a volume number. Namely, it assigns to the area of the ball of radius r around 0 if r is larger than m over 2. It assigns to this the volume of the ball of radius r around 0 outside the ball of radius m over 2 around 0. So in other words, the isoparametric profile for any such surface up here assigns the volume of this region here. You take, given the concentric sphere, you take the volume between the sphere and the horizon. No? It's in this coordinate system. Just the coordinates radius here. Just the, just the coordinate here. So it's right. So, but this, but this here is then a function which is independent of the uh, of the of the coordinate setting. Yeah, just assigns area to volume for this concentric sphere. So this is coordinate independent concept. And then you work out properties of this phi m. And the key properties you find are first of all that the phi m of area is of course as r uh, becomes big or as the area becomes big you get the same thing as in Euclidean space. So you get 1 on 6 square root of pi times s to the 3 over 2. It has to start like this because it's uh, asymptotically Euclidean. And then the next term you work out is 1 half m times s and then you have lower order. So in other words um, the mass shows up in the deviation of the isoparametric behavior. So it's just like infinitesimally, the scalar curvature tells you infinitesimally how you div differ in terms of isoparametric behavior from uh, Euclidean space. The mass near infinity in our model space tells you how the volume differs from the volume in Euclidean space up to leading order. Right. And you can also work out a direct formula for technical purposes. It's quite useful. Um, you get a formula for um, some, some, some quantity here that I uh, don't need right now. But you can work out properties and you can actually use Mathematica to write out this, form this function explicitly. But the key thing really is this formula here. Because this now suggests a definition. This suggests how, for a general asymptotically flat 3-manifold, how you should de define the mass at infinity. So, and here's the definition. You say the isoparametric mass, before we had the isoparametric cone angle, now you say the isoparametric mass of the 3-manifold is simply the limit as the... Um, uh, area of a boundary tends to infinity, you take the limb soup and you solve this for m. So you take 2 over the area, so I bring this on the other side, times uh, the uh, difference of the volume of omega minus 1 on 6 square root of pi times the area uh, to the 3 over 2. Well, I, this is just a computation. I mean, this yeah. is a given function. M the mass. So, so no, I, oh, why, why, why do I call it m the mass? Uh, because you can compute, compare um, the, when you take this space time and you work out the time like geodesics in the corresponding um, space time, uh, then you can compare them uh, to Kepler orbits in the Newtonian theory. And then you see that uh, the constants are such that this m is exactly the mass. So it's inertial mass. 
So, so this is an airshell mass. Uh, this is the, 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 the total mass, including everything that, that is seen by a particle far, by an observer far away. Yeah. The effect. And, and, and this formula, by the way, is not just right in general relativity for black holes. I mean, this is also the correct metric outside a static star, right? And if you have a sta static star and you don't have a black hole, you have filled in some fluid in the middle. But the metric in the exterior is still the same as here. Yeah. So it has been checked by the physicists that this formula is right for all examples they, they have, for all reasonable examples. Yes? Uh, in the Newtonian picture, you can take uh, integral of, I mean, you can, of course, um, uh, take uh, just the integral of, uh, of uh, derivatives of u, as I did here, right? But uh, it turns out you can also write a formula m uh, as a limit of integrals, I think, did it as an integral over, say, an annulus of uh, u itself. So it is possible to write down a definition of mass for a subharmonic function, uh, which just depends on integrals of u, with no, no derivatives of u involved. Right? And then you can actually prove a positive mass theorem for this thing, for subharmonic functions. Right? There's a positive mass theorem for subharmonic functions. And the proof is just the Hopf maximum principle for c0 subharmonic functions, which you have because you have the mean value inequality. Right? There's a maximum principle which from coming from the mean value property, as we all know. Right? And, and this, this maximum principle for subharmonic functions allows you to prove a positive mass theorem for subharmonic functions. After, after you're writing this limit, which is integral of derivative, as a limit of the function itself. Yes, right, right, exactly. Right. It's actually quite neat. I can I, I can I can show you. So and and uh, so so that's why I think there is sort of a beautiful analogy between subharmonic functions and the mean value inequality, and sub uh, isoparametric metrics uh, with the isoparametric inequality. Yeah? That's sort of a complete analogy between the two things. Yeah. Here, when I write volume. Uh, no, no, in just example, you say, uh, we took only a particular observer, it was there. Oh, right, but because I, take the, because I take the limit here, the reference surface I choose is irrelevant. So I could have, since, since in this definition I just take the limit for huge spheres, I could have taken any other uh, ref fixed reference surface to compute the volume. Because that's just yeah, differs. Yeah. I'm dividing by s, so I so 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 I would just sh you see if I shift it by some constant after dividing by s, since s tends to infinity, the constant the shift would not matter in the definition. Oh, then uh, you might get uh, the, a number which is too small. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So 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 that's why you you really have to take the limb soup. You have to take the best. The best. the best. Right, that's a theorem, of course. That's I have to prove, right? So that's a, th a theorem. Yes, uh, the uh, isoparametric profile, the name here is justified. I can prove the isoparametric inequality, and these are the optima. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. So, right. so this scale, besides this example, it's still an integration problem. Mm -hmm. It's the right. Right, so it's the right. That's the other point. Remember when I, when I had the thing on the cone? When I had the theorem on the cone, when, when we looked at the cone, I had to divide by area to the 3 over 2, or I had to divide by volume, which, yeah? But, but here, I need something which has dimension of distance. So it comes out exactly right. Volume divided by area has a dimension of distance. Right? If, you, if you apply this thing to a cone, you c get infinity, of course. Right? But but for the for this graph of the mass, it's just right. Yeah. So, so the, the scaling is crucial. You have to divide exactly by area, otherwise it doesn't work. So, so under what condition, all of the condition of metrics, this quantity is already defined? 
It's always defined. Might be infinite, but it's always oh, well maybe defined. Infinite. Maybe infinite. See, that's the beauty. <laughs> this is immediately a um, geometric invariant. I don't have to prove anything, right? And obviously, for Euclidean space, it gives the right answer for you because of the isoparametric inequality in Euclidean space. You get zero. All right. And uh, it gives the right answer in, in Schwarzschild. And the main thing is, of course, now the following theorem. So the theorem says uh, that, indeed, it gives the right answer. So uh, the um, isoparametric mass uh, is the same as the soup of the Hawking masses uh, of uh, d omega where omega inside m3 g bar uh, is outward minimizing. And the Hawking mass is, uh, let's put this here under definition, the Hawking mass of any two surface is um, the area to the 1 half over 16 pi to the 3 over 2 times 16 pi minus integral mean curvature squared d mu. This is the Hawking mass. What was suggested by Hawking as a local concept, quasi-local concept of mass, and it turns out it's just the right concept uh, to fit in with this isoparametric mass. So in that theorem on the cones, we were able to characterize the cone angle as sort of the infimum of the integral h squared. There was a scaling invariant quantity. So this time, we again compare integral h squared in spheres in Euclidean space. This would be exactly 0. So we check how much bigger can we make this. That means how small can integral h squared be. And we scale it in order to get the correct scaling. But we have to use it on good surfaces. This quantity is useless on bad surfaces, because on bad surfaces will be negative. Negative mass is useless. So we have to choose good surfaces. And turns out the good surfaces are exactly the outward minimizing ones. Yeah. And in general relativity, you see immediately how crucial this outward minimizing concept is because of this well-known picture. See, if you have a Riemannian 3-manifold where in a tiny black hole, behind a tiny neck, you have sort of a lot of things going on. And then, of course, this is a minimal surface. But the mass here is a very small. You have a very small mass. This mass here only sees this black hole sees only the size of this black hole. It doesn't see this one because it's hidden behind the other one. And therefore, the relation would be completely wrong if I take the soup over all of them because then I would get this number. I have to take the outward minimizing one. This one is outward minimizing, but this one is not because this is a smaller competitor. Yeah? So this guy here is not outward minimizing. Right, so that's how the proof works. So the, uh, if I take outward minimizing ones, I can use inverse mean curvature flow and show that along the weak solution, this quantity will be monotone. But if I start with something which is not outward minimizing like this, then it will not be monotone because the area, the first factor, will jump down. Yeah, that's, the, that's where the, the proof would break down. So the, that, well, that's what, what I said in this last lecture. The area will only be continuous at time 0 if you start with something outward minimizing. And that's exactly where this proof would break down. If you start here, the area will not be continuous at time 0, and the Hawking monotonicity would be wrong. Yeah. Right. So, OK, so that's the theorem. And the theorem, of course, implies if you just stare at it for a little bit, it implies the positive mass theorem, so the isoparametric mass 
of M3G is greater or equal to zero, and it implies the Penrose inequality. So 16 pi M isoparametric squared is larger than uh, the outermost horizon if the uh, sigma 2H uh, is connected. And uh, if the ADM mass is well defined, uh, if ADM exists, it's the same. Right. And now, um, my dream theorem would be, of course, so here's the, here's the hope or conjecture. Uh, Hopefully, we can do this just for, three, for M3G with just G in C0, if this is sub-isoparametric. In this sense, you see the left-hand side here makes sense <coughs> in C0. You still have to worry about exactly what you mean by sub-isoparametric. This will be part of the theorem. Um, then you want that... Uh, G is globally sub-isoparametric, i.e. M iso greater or equal to zero. So um, I, 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 because of this beautiful analogy with subharmonic functions, and for subharmonic functions you have a C0 positive mass theorem, I think there's a chance to get a C0 positive mass theorem uh, completely analogous in this sense where the uh, subharmonic functions and their mean value inequality is replaced by sub-isoparametric metrics and the um, isoparametric inequality. Yeah, so I think this is the most natural way and most general way to state the positive mass theorem. It is clear it also transfers to any dimension, but I have no idea how to prove it in higher dimensions. Yeah. Yes, right. So this is exactly what I say. There will be technical difficulties. How um, do I make this definition? Uh, do I just ask that the, this difference divided by r to the 5 limit r tending to 0 greater or equal to 0? Is that, is that enough? That, that, that will be an issue. Or do I need a slightly stronger condition? Yeah, that will be definitely an issue. Yeah, just like for these cones, right? So you can characterize, the, in some sense, the, just like you can characterize in this theorem the cone angle in terms either of the uh, isoparametric behavior or in terms of the infimum of integral h squared. So I claim that in the mass case, you can characterize it by the isoparametric behavior or by the soup of the Hawking mass. And if you see the minus sign, then the soup of the Hawking mass, of course, is related to the inf of integral h squared there. The key point is you need a low, some lower bound on integral h squared. You have to, yeah? And the, the calculation is more complicated, but in principle, it is similar to the calculation that I did here, right? When I, is it still on the board? No, I erased it, but I remember I, I did the calculation where I looked at the difference of this thing and, uh, and, and showed a monotonicity. So the key calculation here, the calculation here is to look at mean curvature flow of some two-dimensional surface sitting inside the three-manifold. And now you have to compute DDT of um, the volume um, but the volume, what you uh, take is you compare the volume to the phi m of the area. So you now take the isoparametric profile of the uh, um, comparison space and subtract the volume of the uh, surface at time t. And you show this is less or equal to 0 if m is larger than um, the uh, um, if m is uh, larger than the Hawking mass of uh, the 
um, surface uh, boundary of t, omega t. So you, you, you do this calculation. This is the key calculation. And uh, for this calculation, you just use this formula here for the derivative of phi. You get something complicated, but you can relate this complicated expression um, to the Hawking mass. And you see that then you get this inequality if this relation is, uh, is true. And uh, um, that's then the key thing. And again, of course, I use this big result of Brian White because this I need along this whole mean curvature flow that the surfaces are outward minimizing because only on the outward minimizing surfaces do I have the uh, lower bound on the uh, on the Hawking mass. Yeah. So um, it's absolutely crucial to know that the solutions of mean curvature flow are outward minimizing. So I think it fits beautifully together with this regularity theory of Brian White and uh, gives them this, uh, uh, this estimate. Right. And of course, this, uh, the other direction, the inverse mean curvature flow, is again uh, using the joint work with Tom Ilman. Right, so I think there's a beautiful analogy between the cones, non-negative Ricci curvature, the mass, uh, non-negative scalar curvature, subharmonic functions fits beautifully together. So now what we need is Perron method for uh, metrics of uh, non-negative scalar curvature or for sub-isoparametric met metrics. And I think that will link us to this, phi, uh, this beautiful conjecture of Robert Bartnick that um, you can link this concept of mass also to a sort of capacity of regions where you have a fixed three-dimensional region and you look at the quasi-local capacity of that region by looking at all extensions of non-negative scalar curvature and uh, take the minimum uh, mass and you should st get a static metric outside that region. Maybe that can be achieved uh, using some of these techniques and the uh, Perron method um, for these sub-isoparametric metrics. But that, I think, is a project for the long-term future. And uh, I stop here, and thank you for your interest. Right, OK. I, uh, I completely ran out of time, so I didn't have time to. So when you do this calculation here, uh, you don't need it. It's the same as before. But when you do the calculation for the monotonicity of the Hawking mass along inverse mean curvature flow, then you have to transform this, uh, the Ricci uh, uh, tensor that appears in the calculation into scalar curvature plus uh, Gauss curvature. Using, and you can do this because you're in two dimensions. The surface is two dimensional. So then you get an integral. Then the Ricci curvature disappears. Only the scalar curvature of the three manifold remains, plus some integral of Gauss curvature where you can apply Gauss Bonnet. And uh, so this possibility of applying Gauss Bonnet in the two dimensional case saves you and allows you to convert a condition of a term that involves Ricci curvature and which would usually kill you, yeah, allows you to transform it into a, in a term just involving scalar curvature. Does it work for, ar for arbitrary dimensions? This one works for arbitrary yeah, dimensions. Yeah, so, yeah. so in this setting, uh, uh, you don't need to assume much of the uh, four of the metrics. And if that means you don't need to, right, to say the uh, inverse mercury flow converge to some nice uh, coding sphere. No, I don't need that it converges to something nice. I need it to exist, right? So I need it to uh, exist, yeah. It used to be applied difficulty things to. No, it could be, uh, if I don't assume much, of course, this, this, these quantities in the limit could be infinite, right? So the Hawking mass, the limit of the Hawking mass going to infinity could be plus infinity, just. Um, but I'm saying if one, if one of them is plus infinity, the other one is also plus infinity. Yeah. 
Right, so it's now, now that is of course much harder because uh, in the four dimensional picture you want to solve the Einstein equations and uh, it is known that for example the ADM mass is um, an invariant that is preserved under some reasonable assumptions near infinity. Now with a C0 initial metric I don't know, uh, nobody knows how to solve the Einstein equations, right? That's a big issue. How weak can you allow the initial data to be? But I still believe that an estimate which only relies on C0 quantities and uh, yeah, you can, you, in some sense, you can see this also as an a priori estimate because why? This Penrose inequality here, see? Um, it is known that the horizon of a black hole tends to increase. The, the area of, of, of a horizon of a black hole tends to increase. Now if this is a uh, invariant which doesn't change at infinity, it means anything that is in between has to be uniformly bounded by the difference. But uh, the thing in between is a nice uh, double integral along this inverse mean curvature flow, which connects the horizon all the way to infinity. So this inequality gives, even for the solution of the Einstein's equations, at least one initial a priori estimate for a certain double integral covering the whole region between the horizon and infinity. And uh, if such an estimate only depends on very low order quantities like area and volume, it hopefully is useful, say, f when studying the um, stability of Schwarzschild. But uh, I'm not claiming uh, this is going to be easy or so. I, I just say such an estimate will be useful. Uh, give give, give, give an, uh, an a priori estimate, a precise a priori estimate at a low level. If I start from something four dimensional, which kind of three dimensional uh, dominant Oh. Um, People mostly use maximal slices. Maximal meaning zero mean curvature, and because of this time uh, flip of sign, zero mean curvature slices don't minimize area, they maximize area. And uh, the, uh, they are particularly straight. For example, there's this theorem by Cheng and Yao that all maximal slices uh, in Minkowski space, entire slices, have to be planes. So maximal slices tend to be as straight as possible, so that's the preferred slice people put in these Lorentzian four manifold. And on these maximal slices from the Gauss equations plus an energy condition, you get exactly this um, non-negative scalar curvature, right? Be because on the, the, the Gauss equations say that the uh, scalar curvature of the three manifold in the Lorentzian setting is the uh, second fundamental form of the three manifold in the four manifold squared minus the trace squared plus uh, 16 pi times the um, this is the t0 0 component of the um, energy momentum tensor. So if you assume this to be greater or equal to zero and if you have a maximal slice then you can conclude that the scalar curvature of the three manifold is uh, non-negative and that's why these are particularly interesting uh, models. Yeah. You uh, said something very uh, tangentially at the moment about doing this in higher dimensions. So would you really expect without, scalar curvature is a much weaker condition in higher dimensions. So is right. Do you, would one really expect that, that this I mean, all your definitions well, the pos yeah, well, the positive mass theorem is true, <laughs> right? <laughs> At least we, you know, in all the low dimensions, we have uh, well-checked proofs, right? So why shouldn't I dream? <laughs> yeah. Now I I recognize all the difficulties, of course, are there. But uh, on the other hand, the theorem is so clean, and the formula, the, the, the formulation is so suggestive that uh, I agree with that. <laughs> right yeah I, I don't know how to prove it yeah right. the dream is actually to approximate the c0 metric by a smooth metric using Ricci flow because then we would have a proof that uses mean curvature flow inverse mean <laughs> curvature <laughs> <of Ricci. laughs> Uh, soup 
actually attend along the flow at the infinity? Or yes, what, yes, yeah. definitely. So all this Right, so you have to do, you have to well, you, but you also have to control, of course, the small, because this is a, here. It's really the soup of all of them, right? And uh, um, say the rigidity case of the positive mass theorem, for example, you prove really starting from a point. You you assume the thing is not R three. It's not flat somewhere. Then you go to that point where it's not flat. Take a tiny sphere, mm -hmm. then you know that the Hawking mass in this tiny sphere cannot be completely zero. You have to find somewhere an outward minimizing tiny sphere where the Hawking mass is strictly positive and then you use the inverse mean curvature flow to send it all the way out to infinity and you see the Hawking mass is still uh, positive at infinity and that gives you then the lower bound on the isoparametric mass. So it's not enough to just look at, so you, it's really the interplay that you can, s on the one hand, you can take huge surfaces and make them as small as you want with mean curvature flow. But you can also take tiny surfaces and can make them as big as you want with inverse mean curvature flow. You have to be able to go in both directions. Otherwise, the theorem doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. General relativity, I guess there are other global quantities that people are trying to get hands on. Like, uh, I, I understand currently there is work on what is angular momentum defined globally, if I'm correct. Would there be, if you think about that, if you thought about that, do you think there would be some nice geometric interpretation uh, like there is here for uh, Right, there's of course a positive mass theorem uh, that um, says that the mass is bigger than the linear momentum. Right, so the, the, the space-time four vector is, is, is a, is a time-like vector, mass, and momentum. That's uh, going back to Shane and Yao. Now, it's known that there cannot be such an inequality in general for the angular momentum. So in, in general, it can be that the angular momenta can sort of cancel out. So you can have sort of big angular momentum here, big angular momentum there, but little angular momentum at infinity. So you can only expect in the axially symmetric case, and there are some theorems where the mass is bounded below by angular momentum if you have axially symmetric uh, uh, solutions. So that's one thing. The one thing that is really uh, open is if we do not have a maximal slice, right? So, so here um, I used r greater or equal to zero, uh, but uh, in, in general um, you would also like to um, um, prove a Penrose inequality uh, if uh, the um, uh, horizon is not a minimal surface and if, the, uh, if on the horizon the second fundamental form of the three manifold in the four manifold is not identically zero then a minimal surface may not be a horizon. You have a more complicated equation for the horizon involving this second fundamental form. Right? You get the equation h equals plus minus the uh, two trace over this second fundamental form. This is the correct equation uh, for the horizon in the most general setting. And then nobody can prove so far the Penrose inequality. So uh, that's a big open problem. Can we prove the Penrose inequality in a general setting? And then there's also quasi-local mass. I think, I think quasi-local mass we have now under control. We know on which surfaces the mass, uh, we, we can define mass. But we don't have quasi-local linear momentum yet. There's been a beautiful suggestion by Mutao Wang and Xing Tung Yao. But uh, they have proved some properties of that uh, quasi-local momentum. But uh, still to be seen whether that is uh, nice. In the, in, in the long run, it would be fantastic to have sort of a notion of quasi-local mass, momentum, angular momentum, and show that it uh, gives sort of a geometro dynamics of regions in space-time, which in the limit coincides with uh, special relativity. That would be sort of a really long-term goal. Yeah. So let's thank the speaker for the wonderful series.